Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Webster, and welcome to the Payments.com digital discussion on fraud prevention with a multi-channel approach. The idiom, seeing is believing, was first recorded in 1639 to mean that people can only be convinced something is true if they can see it with their very own eyes. It's a phrase that's been used millions and millions and millions of times since then, and probably by each of you at least once. Now, I used to hear it a lot growing up whenever my mother would ask my brother how he did on his last math or science or English test, and he said, great. Seeing is believing, she would say, and I'll leave it to you to guess how many times what she heard matched what she ultimately saw on my brother's report card. It's also an idiom that serves us well today and for this discussion. We hear many in financial services describe the perils of fraud in payments today, brought about by the growing sophistication of the cyber criminal who has identified us as his target market, as well as the many suggestions we hear made about the best way to address it. Today's discussion centers on the fraud issues that Star One Credit Union, now 61 years old and the 10th largest credit union in the country, was facing and the many ways they had tried to address it over the years. Marguerite Mucker, Star One's EVP of Operations, will take us on her journey of finding fraud, fighting fraud, being frustrated about the fraud fighting process, and then being introduced to the Guardian Analytics team. Jesus Ortiz from Guardian will describe the process of working together with Star and Marguerite over a period of years to create and beta test a solution that they both say has made a magnificently big difference in identifying and stopping fraud before it happens for Star One Credit Union and many others like them. So since seeing is believing, we'll share this story today, and at the end of our time, let you be the judge. So with that, I'd like to introduce Marguerite, and Jesus, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So without further ado, um, Marguerite, I wonder if you could, since this is this is really your story. Um, I'd love for you to, to, to give us a little bit more context about Star One Credit Union. I gave it the, the flyover, but I'm sure there are things that I didn't say that you can give it justice. So uh, why don't you tell us? Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, just to add to the slides that you see about Star One, I um, want to give you a little bit more background. We have six branches. Um, we only serve Santa Clara County, so we, we are only serving one county. Now, Santa Clara County is fairly large um, with almost 2 million uh, residents in the county. And, uh, you know, we serve uh, members who work or live in, in Santa Clara County and their family members. And we have about nearly 200 employees, um, you know, at Star One. So, um, and, you know, we um, kind of going back, uh, and, and I don't know if that's good enough or if you want me to uh, no, go on. So that, that, I mean, that, that's great. I mean, I think, it, I think it provides, you know, some sense of the, of the size and the scale and, and, and certainly the client base that you serve. Um, you know, being in the heart of Silicon Valley, you have a client base that has a diverse set of needs and uses a number of different services of the credit union and payment services as well. So, so, so transitioning into the discussion of fraud, um, you know, I, I said in my setup that, that the conversation about fraud isn't a new one, but the tactics that the fraudsters are using are, are certainly diversifying. I guess I'll, I'll put it like that. Um, we're seeing new account fraud rising. We're seeing account takeovers on the rise as well. And that creates uh, additional complexity for really understanding how to identify it and then, and then surely how to, how to prevent it. But I'm sure you had your own triggers as you were wrestling with this problem over the years. So perhaps, Marguerite, you could tell us what some of those issues were. Yeah, so I'm gonna take everybody back to 2006. And I think most of you remember that FFIEC came out with a multi-factor authentication in uh, late of 2006 to, uh, to uh, assist with the, um, the online fraud that was occurring at that time. And, um, you know, I think for a lot of us, it was kind of a painful implementation, getting um, our members used to the 
the MFA and the requirement and and even our members who are in Silicon Valley and are very tech savvy, um, they they really didn't like it as much. But um, back then, you know, we were aware of uh, you know some of the 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 viruses uh, that were that members uh, PC were impacted with the keystroke logging malware, the man in the middle browser attacks. I mean, we knew some of the stuff was going on, and um, and at the time. You know, we were we were wondering how we could protect against that, and um, and we also thought at that time um, that we didn't have any online banking fraud because we hadn't really seen anything in that channel. Um, but you know, at the same time, we were usually very proactive, so we always kind of wanted to 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 see how what we can do to protect our members. Um, what we also knew at the time, even so with our educated members, um, that, you know, the, the multi-factor authentication at the time wouldn't really protect the members from some of the, the fraud that was occurring. And, um, and, and we also knew that any losses uh, of fraud that was, you know, members had, that Star One would stand behind that loss and make the member whole. And um, so it was in our own interest to really to find a solution or to find a method on how we could protect our members from themselves and from the, the viruses that were going on at that time. And um, Mark, I think, you know, I think the point that, um, that you just made, that you didn't think you had a problem in online banking is an important one because I think that's a clue to, uh, to what we're going to see um, unpacked as, as we as we as we take your your fraud journey forward. But that's an important uh, important point. Exactly, exactly, and and it goes back to what you said earlier. How you started out seeing is believing, <laughs> and we'll have the story to tell. Um, so so yes, so we you know so we we implemented the the multi factor authentication, um, but at the same time um, and and you know during that time there were other vendors on um, on this on market. Um, there was a vendor that uh, um, pro to protect the members from 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 fraud and and viruses and. And one was that um, where a member was required to download a widget on on their PC now. You know, we looked at that, and even though it was uh, uh, functional, but we did not want members to download anything because members don't really know what they're downloading, and it could be a virus that they're downloading. So we kind of shied away from that uh, method. And then another method was out there that was basically um, a, a rule-based uh, uh, solution. And um, what we were concerned about at that time too, about a lot of false positives, and we didn't have the staff to sort through a lot of false positive um, alerts. So, um, so you know, so we were just kind of evaluating, trying to figure out what we needed to do, and um, and just as it would have it, Guardian Analytics um, kind of contacted uh, uh, Star One and asked if we're interested in in. In beta testing the solution, and and what what caught our interest and why we actually proceeded uh, with Guardian was that it was not just a rule based, but it also was behavioral based, and that was something new at the time, and that was, that intrigued us, and that led us to um, to Guardian to beta test and ultimately implement their solution. So, so, so Marguerite, let's let's talk a little bit about your perspective on on fraud and the threats that we're facing you. I love your last bullet. It's not a matter of if, but 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 when. I think, yeah, you know, I think we're all unfortunately uh, facing that reality. But um, but still, Yeah. So and and we we kind of know that. Um, and you know, and it kind of goes back to um, the criminals. They're very smart. Um, they can get past our limits. You know, they have uh, methods of trying to figure out. Sometimes it's us posting our limits or on our website to you know to educate our members. But at the same time, we're educating our the fraudsters as well. Um, they know how to get past the authentication methods that are in place. Um, they they know how to trick members into uh, phishing, responding to a phishing email, and um, 
you know, and then, then also what, well, you know, what we saw, and that was moving forward with Guardian, that um, there was a lot of cross-channel fraud. And, um, and, you know, we looked at, we had check fraud, we had wire fraud, we do a lot of wires, and we allowed members, uh, you know, to, to wire, uh, to fax wire, tra uh, wire transfer form to us. And, uh, and social engineering, even back then we had social engineering. It wasn't quite as, you know, rampant. It kind of um, was there, kind of went away, and now it's back in full force. But um, so, so we kind of knew what kind of was going on, and we knew that, that we were vulnerable or our members were vulnerable. And, and, and so then having all these threats that you understand, um, are out there, what was your attitude or what is your attitude on, on preventing them? Well, you know, um, so we tried, to, a lot of it relied on staff, right? We did a lot of member verification. We did call back to members to validate a form, a wire request that we had received. Um, so we, we did a lot of, uh, you know, time-consuming uh, processes to validate the information that we had received, so we, you know, hoping to prevent fraud. So to rely, a lot of it, uh, staff, staff validating the information. But, but, but why is starting with payment, why do you say starting with payment fraud is too late? Oh, um, because, um, you know, once, once, once you see the request, um, well, I guess what we learned is it's, it's once it comes through, it's too late. You can't prevent it. You may can prevent the, the, the next fraud attack for the member. But um, we are, um, what, you know, and ultimately, this is kind of seeing and believing going back. Um, we, we, we thought our online banking system was secure. We never, even though we had fraud, but it occurred in other channels and never online, quote, never online. Um, so when we, what we learned when we were beta testing with Guardian, which was really an eye-opener to us, that some of the fraud that had occurred in other areas, in, 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 you know, in other payments like wire transfers or ACH, um, actually originated on, in online banking. And, hmm. and, and yeah. Wow. So, so are you going to take us through, is, is the first case study um, an examination of, of that identification? I mean, because that, that seems like a really interesting case study to walk us through. Um, sure. Um, we, we um, so we had a member, well, we had a member um, who, who um, had a bill pay, um, Schedule. So a process was able through a phishing email to um, to steal members' account information, uh, the credentials. They logged into the account, created new bill payee, and uh, sent a check to themselves. Um, we we uh, you know when the when the member contacted us and or we contacted the member um, and then they said okay you know um, I didn't do that. Um, we. Uh, you know, we we kind of um, reverse the transaction because we always kind of make the member whole. It was, you know, it, he was a victim of a Roman scam victim, and um, you know, and they didn't know what they were doing. So, so what we, you know, what we felt at the time um, that the phishing email and the the, the the consequently the login into online banking. Um, if we had Guardian in place at that time, Guardian would have been able to detect that unusual login uh, from a different IP address, from a different browser environment, from a different location, um, and uh, would have provided us with an alert where we could go in and, and um, you know, review the alert and saying this is an unusual behavior for this member. The member never used bill pay, so um, why all of a sudden, you know, would they open up an account and send out a check? So, um, especially when it's a long-term member. So, um, you know, going going through that the exercise and going back and what we learned when we were t testing with Guardian, um, we realized that you know the the 
the, the login would have been our first clue that something is, is, is wrong with, with this member's account. Um, if we didn't have it, then we would have just looked at it and said, okay, maybe, um, you know, the member did that or, um, or, or he was just, a, you know, a scam and he fell a victim. So um, the login was, was critical at that time. So, 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 Margaret, why do you call this a romance scam? I mean, I, I have the, you know, I have this, this impression in my, in my mind about what, what this is, but the, is it what it sounds like? Uh, what kind of scam? I'm sorry. What is, what is a romance scam? Oh, well, it's, it's uh, you know, members going online and, and chatting with somebody and um, thinking, you know, uh, becoming romantically involved as in with sending emails back and forth, I care for you, you know, I, you know, they have conversations and, and out of those conversations, the, the, the victim cares for the fraudster and then when the fraudster has that, uh, knows that that victim is trusting them, then they ask them for the money and they're playing on emotions. Um, it's usually wow. a person that is lonely and, um, you know, and the fraudsters are very good about uh, uh, portraying that they care and that they really care for the victim and then ultimately it results in send me some money because I'm in need, you know, I have a problem and because you're my friend or, you know, you, can you help me with that? And usually it's um, the, the victim falls, um, wow. you know, victim to so, that type of fraud. So it, it, is, it is exactly as described. Um, yes, it is, yes. So, so help us understand, you talked about um, multi-channel, cross-channel fraud. So help us understand um, fraud related to access to credentials in one channel being used in another, in this case, uh, in this case, call center. Um, yes. Um, so, so um, once again, it, it, you know, this time it was more of a social engineering attempt to um, to obtain members' login credential and information. And uh, with that, and you know, that is happening today uh, as well. Um, you know, so the fraudsters contact the call center, they change the phone number. So if we're trying to do a call back, we actually end up talking with the fraudster, thinking it is a member. And, um, but in this case, the fraudster logged into our member's account and viewed several clear checks, um, um, you know, to, to view the member's signature and then consequently um, initiated a wire transfer, um, copying the member's signature and sending it in. And uh, since, since they, you know, since the signature appeared to match and the phone number routed to the fraudster, um, we approved the transaction, so we did our normal procedure. We validated um, the signature against our signature card. We called the member back, thinking it was a member, and um, and approved the transaction. And um, and then you know, obviously, when the member um, um, looked at the statements, and that wasn't a member who logged in every day to check their balance at the time, so he noticed that the money was was missing. And this was actually during the, the beta test with, with Guardian. And we actually took a loss. So this, this money was gone. We took the loss. And when, after the fact, we asked Guardian to kind of go back, we didn't give Guardian any information and just said, hey, can you go look back and say, if, if you did the analysis on the login in the last six months, uh, let us know what you, what, what you see. Well, Guardian did, and they came back with a red alert on that particular login at the time when that brought their logged in for the first time to view the check images. And, and this is the case of seeing is believing. This sold us. We knew if we would have had Guardian in place, we, could, we would and could have prevented that fraud. It was clear as well. Um, because the fraud they logged in from an unusual IP address uh, wasn't in, in the normal member's interest. Uh, the same um, browser PC was different. And also um, looking repeatedly at the same check image um, is, is unusual in itself. A member normally goes in, looks at the check image, then they go on and look at another check image, but to look at the same 
identical jet image, you know, five or six times in a matter of, you know, a short period of time. It just doesn't make sense. So anyway, that actually sold us on the product, validated what, uh, what we had discussed with Guardian and what Guardian actually promised us the, the product could deliver, and that case um, really sold us. And um, we actually took that case um, to the board as a validation that the product was worth it, working and they approved to move forward with Guardian Analytics. So it was very telling, very uh, enlightening in that respect. I mean, it's interesting, the next example we're going to go through is a similar example of social engineering. I mean, that is, I mean, this is clearly a, um, you know, obviously the pattern of how the fraudsters are acquiring credentials. And, and I guess, you know, what I'm picking up is the behavior that um, your fraud program now um, identifies isn't just device and different IP address, but it's, it's behavior with respect to, you know, you said the number of times an image is, is, is looked at, um, obviously different behaviors in terms of amounts and, and payees. You know, the, the, the social engineering aspect of fraud is, is, is really scary because the fraudsters are getting very good at it. It's, it's uh, you know, when we all get the emails as, as consumers and we're, we're sensitive to them, so we, we take a, a closer look at things that don't look or perhaps resemble something we should be getting from our financial institution. But um, you know, but mo but most people may not be that be that careful. They do look very convincing. Yes, and you know, it's 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 interesting. And and uh, in this particular case, this was an um, educated member. He was in the tech uh, industry. And when we talked to him and, um, you know, we said, because, you know, when we got a red alert, it looked very unusual and, and, and you know, and the member kind of says, oh, you know, I know the, I'm in the tech industry, I know my security, I'm really good at protecting myself. And, and we always kind of go, one of our um, areas when we'd contact the member, we would say, hey, look at your PC, make sure you don't have any malware, run some programs, virus checks, right? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I do that, I'm, I'm, I, I have no problem with this. And then we kind of go, well, then we recommend you change your username and password and, and you know, and hope everything is good moving forward. And, um, you know, he, he, he was adamant, the member was adamant saying that he had no problem, his PC was secure, and, you know, so we kind of had to, had to let it go because he only can, um, say so much to the member, right? But what's, what's interesting is that after we had talked to him, and even though he was adamant saying that he, he, he has good security practices and he wouldn't, ha he wouldn't have a virus on his PC, I guess it, he, it, he got, he was thinking about it and, and, and actually checked his PC and he called us back a couple of weeks later and he actually validated, he said, you know what, I was thinking about what you said, I did check my PC and sure enough he had a key logger uh, on his system, and that's how he was compromised. Um, wow. So, you, you know, it's kind of going back where we're saying we're trying to protect the member from themselves, even though they're convinced they're doing everything right. Um, you know, there's so many ways a, a, a virus can be embedded in their PC, and, and they are not aware of it. Yeah, no, that, that is... Uh... That is scary. It's something I know I, I try to pay attention to, but you know, life gets in the way, and sometimes you don't. Uh, yeah. But we don't always know, and uh, uh, it's uh, it, it, it's something to pay attention to. So let's talk about another um, another example. Um, what do you mean fraud from with within? Is this within a member's family? Yes, it is, and um, you know we sometimes call it. Uh, a friendly fraud. Um, we see that a lot in, in uh, credit card transactions where a member family gives somebody else a card to do a transaction and then that person does that one allowed transaction, then they do a couple of extras. Um, but this one was interesting because um, this member disputed some visa charges and what was kind of interesting that, you know, the fraudster supposedly um, made charges, but they also made some payments, and we said, okay, that's kind of odd. You know, a fraudster never makes payments. They just try to delete, uh, deplete the account. 
so when the member actually came in to the branch um, with with the you know, they came into the branch to talk about it, and the branch staff actually referred them back to Web Services to talk to them about it. And when Web Services talked to the member and kind of explained to them what what Guardian Analytics did in the in the back end, that all the logins, because they claimed part of it was online fraud as well, right? And when Web Services explained to them that Guardian knows, uh, you know, the IP address, can say the location, the browser environment, and the PC, and that all the logins happened at the same PC, same place, which is basically the member's home, and they kind of said somebody had to come into your home, had to have access to your PC in order to do this transaction. Well, the, the member, after talking with web services, felt really bad and felt guilty, and then ultimately admitted it wasn't fraud, that, that they had done it, and they, it was a mother, father, daughter thing, that the, do, the mother was helping the daughter but wouldn't, didn't want to tell the father, and so, but they kind of broke down and admitted that, no, we did it, and we just, you know, it's a family thing, and, and we didn't want the dad to know that the mother was giving the daughter money. Anyway, but what, what validated is, so we, you normally always say, oh, we, we, you know, we detect fraud. Guarding in this case, um, validated it was not fraud. It was actually the member doing those transactions, but the member was telling us a different story. But having that guardian running, we could be very firm with the member saying, highly unlikely, how would somebody would have access to your home, to your PC, to your login credentials, so, and that actually, you know, so we didn't have to take a loss on the, on the credit card charges, because normally on credit card charges, if a member claims it's fraud, we just have to take it because we can't really prove any different in this. And in this case, Guardian helped us, you know, just no, by validating no, it was a legitimate login. No fraud, but, you know, there's probably, you know, a family that's uh, still fighting over this. <laughs> yeah. You never want dad to know anything. I mean, that's the whole point. Um, but yeah. I, 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 I think that was a, a little taken to, a, to an extreme. Um, you know, a lot of times when we talk about solutions and 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 fraud prevention, fraud detection, um, you know, it's it, it's critical to talk about about scale and and whether this can perform at scale. Can you can you shed some insight on that on that dimension of the solution and and your journey? Yes, and you know, and I when I kind of started out initially that we were where we're. We were aware of some of the fraud um, solutions out in the industry, but a lot of them had a high false positive. And the way we're staffed, um, we couldn't really justify at the time saying we need a full-time person to, to just monitor alerts and, and, and uh, review them. So, um, so one of the things that, you know, we worked with Guardian on is, is about the false positive, and they initially had informed us that knows the way our system works, it really limits the false positives, that when you have alerts, there's really substance to it, and you can have actually something to investigate on. And, and sure enough, you know, we go through it that we, um, we had, you know, it's green, yellow, and red, and green are good, yellow is some, Unusual, but not extremely unusual. It could be that I just logged in from a different PC uh, while I was traveling or something. And reds are really the ones that we focused on and concentrated on. So, you know, we really only had a, a, a small percentage from our normal logins that actually resulted in alerts. And then, and you know, like I said, less than 4% of those um, required qualifying. And when we say qualifying, is is looking at it and, and making a determination that in fact it was a legitimate login and not a fraudulent login, and uh, and then and then on the on the red, you know that's really uh, you know what we focused on mostly is was really making sure that okay whether it looked normal or the member maybe was traveling and we had a travel notification on on the system. Um, or in some cases, we actually called the member and validated. And this was another um, uh, um, concern of ours because we didn't want to call our members all day long saying, hey, we saw an unusual login, is it you or not? And, and, and one of it we were extremely careful about was we didn't want to alarm members 
and making them think that the online ch channel wasn't secure. So, um, so we did a lot back office, and only when we really saw it was really a very unusual login, um, you know, login from Ukraine, and the member is located in the U.S. and not traveling. So sometimes that, that warranted a call to the member to validate um, the information. And then sure enough, you know, if, if, if it was the member says, load, that's not me. I'm, you know, I have don't I haven't been traveling and I don't know anybody in Ukraine. And then we know then that was a fraudulent login. And then, you know, we take action. So but but they were very manageable and um and that was really our main uh point. We wanted to focus on something that was really um where we could take action and not waste a lot of time. So they were really very um pinpoint and, and usually there was you know, um, we looked at it, and it, maybe it was a red, but it was enough where it raised some attention, and we could explain it away either by just looking at the member's behavior and transaction history, and um, and like I said, the thumbs that really stood out when it was really an odd one of the transaction activities that that this person performed in online banking sometimes warranted that call out to the member. So, so but it was me. very manageable. But performing, performing at scale and, and, and narrowing the number of, of actions that, that you need to take. A question is, uh, that came in is, is, on average, how many alerts do you work a day? Um, you know, so we, we uh, average we work probably um, uh, in a day, let me think. Um, Maybe we look at 200 that come in, and and then you know 41. We kind of about 40 of them look that would require further action, and uh, and then maybe there's less than than 10 that kind of needs needs more information. It's working really good, um, and it's very manageable. And um, staff, you know, it, it takes a little learning initially, but once staff is comfortable with knowing what they need to look at. They can look in an alert and pretty quickly make an assessment when it, whether it's a legitimate alert or not. So even you know if there are 200 alerts. Oh my God, how long will it take? It's a, it's a quick process because they can eliminate them pretty quickly. So the next slide is going to put the dollars and cents to this, but I want to ask a question about that. Um, so how do the alerts? Um, actually, how are they categorized? What what type of alert for what type of potential fraud? Is it related to, you know, wire, um, you know, login, bill pay? Can you help us understand that? Yeah, so we, you know, there's, there's different ways. Um, and, we, you know, so initially, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is, this is hey, Susan, and I can add a little bit of that. So, we uh, have multiple products that protect different channels, the wire channel, the HCH, mm -hmm. channel, the online channel. So you get, uh, we protect each of those channels, and when we recognize something just doesn't make sense, it's, it's not normal, we present a series of risk factors, what we call risk factors. These are things that don't add up. Uh, the IP address is incorrect, or it's very different than than what is normally used. The browser is is not what is normally used. The PC type, the location in which the user is right now, and and where the user was, you know, the last time he executed the transactions. For example, we can determine that, you know, the last time the user did something, you know, an hour ago. They were in Santa Clara, and an hour later, they are in New York. That doesn't add up. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't. Uh, it, it, it's not. It's not normal. So, uh, hopefully, that 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 helps answer the, you know, the question you were asking. Yeah. And, and just so I just want to add something too. So we, yes, we do have all the products, the various products, um, ACH and Wire, and online. And uh, but also, um, you, you know, some of it is 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 the online the the fraud happens in the online banking channel, and then there's a wire request submitted, right? So um, mm -hmm. having both, you can see where the fraud actually originated. Like I said, we we you know 
the case that I had with the 98,000 earlier, um, it was a, a form that we received from the member, and we thought it was, you know, a, a process just submitting a, a wire transfer request, not knowing or realizing that the initial breach happened in the online banking system. So, so this allows you to kind of uh, trace it back and saying, okay, yeah, it was a wire transfer. We call it a wire transfer fraud, but it really originated in the online banking channel. And the same case can be for the bill pay transaction. So we can see that, you know, in the online banking, that the, the, the compromise happened in the online banking channel and, and, a, and a fraud that submitted a bill payment. So we see it there, but we also see it in an ACH file. Okay, because it is an ACH trans it's a transaction. So sometimes the channels work well together. So, so your point about, your point very early on is that you noticed zero fraud in the online banking channel, but that was really where the fraudsters were accumulating credentials to use in other channels. Is that right? Yes, yes. <clears throat> and they were able, you know, to, to change information, um, and, and so, and consequently, <clears throat> you know, now it seems, you know, this is like 11 years later, <laughs> you know, now we have a lot of other um, steps in place where <clears throat> if a member submits a wire transfer request and there was a change of address in the last month or a phone number change in the last month, we're doing extra steps to validate because of what we learned um, what was happening, happening in the online banking channel. We thought the member was updating the address and updating the phone numbers, and in reality it was a fraudster. So now we have, you know, some other uh, criteria that staff needs to look at before they submit a request. And, and it's like, you know, when was the request submitted? How was it submitted? And was there any unusual activity in, in the online banking channel that, that would indicate there's something wrong with that request so yeah I, I, I guess I guess it is important to put uh, to put the time frame in, in perspective 2006 uh, is 11 years ago so the last yeah, decade yeah. has evolved in, in many ways including in the sophistication of the of the cyber criminal but I think the point that you're making is that they are very clever and they understand how to how to multitask, multi-channel their operations to uh, to try to do whatever they can to uh, to extract money. On 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 this. So so when you see activity like this, where credentials are compromised in one channel and they're used in another, does that happen in rapid fire fashion? Is there a delay? Does yeah, what, what's the what's the typical pattern if there is such if, if there is such a thing? But it, it doesn't always happen immediately. I mean, because uh, they're typically trying to learn some information, so they compromise the online, and they're using that to gather information, and that typically takes time because mm -hmm. for them to execute the fraud in a different channel. Right. That's our experience. Yeah, and and I can validate that. And especially, um, you know, especially if it's a if it's an online banking login where a member doesn't log in all the time, they may only log in once a month or you know quarterly. They're not heavy users, um, so sometimes to detect in an unusual login um, takes takes a little time. So the foster has time to log in, make a request that may may show up as a yellow alert, but it doesn't rise to the level of um, urgency where staff would say that's highly unusual. But then subsequent, you know, logins can trigger then a red alert. So, so, so sometimes the forces are quick because they know they need to get in and out. So, because they know advice have some kind of protections to to you know, to monitor that, and then sometimes they compromise, lay low, and come back later when you think nothing is going on, um, and then by, you know, then you go, oh my God, yes, it was a fraudulent lot again. So it, it, it goes both ways. Yeah, and, and that's, that's what you want to do. That, that's just lovely. It's a scary place. I mean, has, has this accelerated, the obvious question I'm sure people are curious about is, is has this 
accelerated given all of the the recent breaches and, and now the availability of so much personal data um, on the dark web for these guys to use and, and, and kind of take their time assembling a, an identity and doing these kinds of things. Yeah, and, and honestly, that is the scary part because with that many credentials being compromised, how do you know um, who is going to access that online banking account or sending a re request when the fraudsters almost have everything they need to really impersonate one of our members? Um, mm -hmm. I honestly, we haven't seen it yet. I'm waiting for it to hit. I think there's going to be a fallout. Um, you know, how do we protect ourselves against that? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if, if some of the, the measures we have in place will really, um, I, well, I believe that it's not going to prevent all fraud. I think with that kind of large scale of, of, of a breach, um, I think we're all a little bit vulnerable, and we don't know how it's going to play out. Um, you know, you talked about earlier about a new account fraud or fraud, uh, account takeover. Prime prime examples of what can happen with with those uh, credentials, right? Impersonating a member and 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 opening up account, and by the time we realize it's fraud, um, you know, the losses are already there, right? So. <laughs> and just to say, Sue, Scott, we just recently did a um, another webinar related to Equifax and what we believe is going to happen because of the the huge, huge volume of of information that was stolen. That the cost of a that we fully yeah. expect uh, that fraudsters are going to be able to much more easily and inexpensively acquire this information and, and, there, and, and therefore it's going to be easy to take over. But as we were talking about earlier, you, you may be able to take over an account, but you don't impersonate the behavior. And, and that's where I think we feel our solution adds uh, the value. So, so before we, before we get to the next slide that talks about kind of your 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 thinking and your approach to that, a question for Marguerite: um, Do you have a specialized fraud team that monitors the red alert? Um, I wouldn't say a specialized. So it's our web services group um, who handles our online and mobile banking uh, channel and and this you know members. Uh, request. We took one of them and um, and gave him the job to review <laughs> the fraud alerts, and um, and it was just a, a staff person. It wasn't anybody that had a lot of IS experience and knew a lot about you know IP addresses. And and that's the other thing. It's it's a, you know sometimes it's intimidating to see. It's like oh my God, what kind of knowledge do my staff? Um, what knowledge does it require to analyze those those alerts? And and it's something that that is actually um, can be learned by any person that has, you know, that provides support uh, to members because it's really about just looking at repetitious information and and just double checking anything that that doesn't um, jive. And and those people, the support people, um, they do understand our members' behavior, right? And so it really, for us, it made sense to keep it with the team that supported. The call center and the members in, in 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 technical questions and online questions because they do um, understand the members and and know how our members behave. So it it isn't a special fraud team. Um, it it isn't within the web services. We have a special fraud team that handles ACH and other type of fraud, but that particular the online channel um, stays within the web services group and it appears to work out well for us. Got it. So, Jesus, um, in the time we have remaining, why don't you help us understand, you know, the approach that you take? Uh, you know, Marguerite kind of gave us the the on the ground view of, of of how it works in practice. But um, help us understand the approach, and then specifically, you know, I, I, I'd like to understand: is there something in particular? I know there are many factors that that contribute to how you process information and trigger an alert. But is there 
is there something or a subset of something that you always look for that, that really become the, the key triggers for fraud? Uh, sure, and um, so I'll be happy to, to describe and talk a little bit about how machine learning actually works and, and, and how we use it. As you know, as Marguerite pointed out earlier, a rule-based systems uh, or, or no system at all is, is uh, just doesn't work. Uh, the rules are have a very uh, binary uh, action to them. It's either yes or no. So once a fraudster figures out what the rule is, they always stay on the no side, right? Because they realize that the rule says if it's less than X, always do less than X. And so, so we we recognize that. And and when the company was started, we decided that we wanted to use something very different, something that that leverage the fact that we can learn the behavior of people. So machine learning uses uh, well-defined patterns or that, that, are, that exist across data science today. Uh, and, uh, and the idea is that you create a, a model, an algorithm, that collects the user data uh, from their activities and transactions, whatever activity it is, online, ACH, whatever. Uh, the data that is collected then allows the model to learn. It gets trained is the term that gets used in, in data science. And it learns that behavior of, of each of the users. Each new activity then provides the model with more information to learn, uh, you know, whether it's uh, the location of where the transactions are being made, amounts, uh, the type of computer, the type of browser, uh, the recipients, uh, the fact that you're looking at, at, at things that you normally don't look at, all of those things are learned behaviors. Uh, the more the model gets this data, the more it learns, and therefore, and, and it creates then a behavioral pattern for every single account that it's receiving data from. So that's the collection of the data. Then uh, when transactions start occurring, they're being made based on the user or the account, uh, the machine learning models then compares those behaviors and, and says, does this behavior match what we expect or what is normal? Uh, if it's normal and, and it matches the expectations, then it gets flagged as green. If there is something that is just slightly off, but the rest, the rest of the risk factors, I used the term earlier, there are things that we call risk factors. Those are the different data points, the different signals that we collect. And if, if some of the risk factors, you know, maybe there's one or two, uh, we might flag it as yellow instead of green. And, okay, this is just not exactly Right, but it's not sufficient enough for us to to tag it as red. But anyway, we do that comparison, then we flag it. If if the risk factors are so many, this is really just completely wrong. The behavior just does not match. Then that's how we flag it as red, and we we create the the risk factors and the alerts, and then the action then can be taken by the financial institution, in this case, star one, uh, to, to decide, you know, what do I do with this alert? Uh, the, plan, the software will recognize, you know, the customer is just not doing something that is normal here. You need to take action, validate it, as Marguerite mentioned, and, and, and make sure that what is being done is, in fact, valid or not valid based on that. To your, to your question, is there one specific thing? No, that, that's the beauty of machine learning. There isn't one thing. We learn uh, many data points, many signals, as we call it, and, and, and based on all of those is we use the whole, not one single thing to, to determine, make that determination, and that's what makes it difficult then for a fraudster to to, to, to mimic the behavior because we're comparing so many things. Uh, you know, 
as, as that is so different from a rule where you're comparing one thing. You know, is, is rule yes or no? So, so that's why, like I said, there isn't one single point. We are looking at many points of data to to make the decision. Um, what I want to add is is we kind of compared the alerts to like the visa risk notification. Um, but what 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 is different and what we like about Guardian, so when with the visa, you know, the the Falcon fraud notification, it is is based on um, trends, national trends, right? It's not specific to one FI. So sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, it triggers alerts uh, um, because whatever if something happening in New York, Brooklyn is a <laughs> good example. Fraud always, always happens in Brooklyn, but. Um, <laughs> So, but, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily impact, you know, out here in California, but we get alerts as well, right? So with Guardian Analytics, what I like about it, it, it learns our members' behavior, too. So it's not just, you know, um, about a, a <clears throat> everybody or the general trend, even though Guardian looks at everything, but it's really tailored to our members' behavior, which makes that alert much more urgent than mm -hmm. if it was a national um, system. So it really looks at the individual, our members' behavior, what is normal for that individual and not what is normal in the industry or for, for uh, consumers in general. And, and, and to add to that, the, um, the model does learn the specific behavior of its user. Now the other additional benefit that Marjorie did is we do also recognize when events occur at other uh, financial institutions, and we continuously then improve our models based on new data, new data points, new signals that 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 are important for us to then incorporate into the model. And again, this is where some of this multi-channel uh, comes in. Based on that, the model continues to improve, evolve, and get better because we feed it some of this new information. So. Uh, you get both benefits, the fact that is, it knows the specific users, but if there are national events or events that occur in other places, uh, we are able to, to improve the model and incorporate those, those events as well. I mean, Marguerite, it looks like the, the favorite uh, mechanism for attempted fraud is wire. That, that's, that's, of course, very scary because there's a big amounts of money. Yes, and and you know, and I don't know if, if um, there's a lot of financial institutions that actually don't really do wires anymore, or make it so difficult when members right. just give up um, because it's such a risky transaction. And uh, with our particular membership, we have a uh, even so um, we're only in Santa Clara County, but our members, because of who they are, they travel a lot and they do international transactions all the time and they move money back and forth between Star One and the investment companies. So we do a large amount of domestic and international wires and it's a service that we offer. And you know, over the years we had to really be strict. We had to put limits on and really, like I said earlier, it, a validation of a wire request could could take an hour or more to validate because of the callback and, and, and calling back the members and we use like um, the Experian out of wallet questions which to me they're now mute because of the <laughs> Equifax breach. Um, so anyway, so there was a lot of work involved and, and but we wanted to offer that service and continue to offer that service to our members. And, and because it's such a risky channel, you know, when, um, you know, we scrutinize it and, and you know, we always would uh, look back at the online banking channel and then when Guardian came out with a wire transfer product, I mean, we were first in line. Um, and just because we had such a high interest in it, because we needed to protect ourselves, right? We needed to protect our organization from potential fraud and 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 so, you know, when the discussion occurred with, with about um, the, the wire, we said, oh, we, we, wanna, we want it, we want to test it because it is it's such an important part to our business. So, um, and yes, the dollar amount is, is high. Um, you know, one wire, right, like the one that $100,000 out of the door, I mean, 
once the buyer is, is done, it's done, and there's no, you cannot get it back, not like an ACH transaction where you have recourse. The wire is gone once you hit that button. So, so in the time that we have left, um, we have a couple of slides to go through. Uh, but, Marguerite, I want the next slide, you know, we talked about seeing is believing. So, uh, so give us the punchline. Well, um, you know, <laughs> we, we, we saw, <laughs> and um, so we, even so, generally speaking, someone, we don't have a lot of losses, um, but any loss that we have is a big deal to us. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and we, our online losses, like, like near, next to near zero, um, it's hard to say that because, you know, a lot of times when you say something happens, so, we're a little bit hesitant sometimes, but it has really, really reduced our losses. We catch um, a lot of requests before they actually are being submitted, so which is really, it's a detection. Uh, we get the alerts, we look into a request. Sometimes if we have a request that comes in and we backtrack and go to web service and saying, hey, we have a wire transfer request, please check this member, is he an online banking user? If he is, any unusual activity, you know, um, what's going on with this. And so we validate a lot, and, and that really, um, really has helped us reduce our online losses. Um, you know, we also worked um, with alerts um, to make sure that we get good alerts. Um, um, like Jesus was talking about, uh, you know, there are thresholds. And, um, you know, like early on, we, we received a lot of yellow uh, alerts that we were talking with Guardian and saying, hey, how can we make this better? Um, because we really can look at everything. So can we tweak it? Um, you know, so we, because we, algorithm, you, you have some options where you can kind of tweak it a little bit. So when you get red, they're really red. So we work with that to, to really keep our uh, alerts manageable. Um, you know, the beauty, we have no rules and scenarios to write. I mean, it's really a, 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 a wonderful product because we don't have to do work. Um, we just have to review. And, and the best piece out of all of it, it's, 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 it's transparent to the members. Members don't know that they have that protection or that we provide that protection. And we, you know, we actually, uh, you know, one of, one of, uh, um, the web service manager who was critical in, in the process with Gaudi, and, and, and he's very uh, security conscious. And, and, and one of his sayings, and I love it because he, used to, he always says, our member can tattoo their password and username on the forehead and for everybody to see, and we know that person is protected. So um, because of, of the, you know, the analysis that goes in behind. And, um, you know, our examiners and, and the board is happy. Um, like I said, when NCUA, uh, when FFIC came out with the, um, the multi-factor and consequently there have been updates to that, having a um, system in place that uses not only does the MFA but, but looks at other uh, pieces like the behavior uh, logins, it's, it's examiners like to see that. And we like to think <laughs> that we don't, criminals don't, um, you know, target Star One as much because um, they have learned that we have tools in place that prevent uh, from them to succeed in it. Doesn't make us immune, but we like to think that because we have uh, a lot of things in place that we're less, less uh, susceptible to fraud. So um, it's been a good experience for us. Time is money for everybody, especially the cyber criminals. So if you're if they're frustrated, they'll move on to the next uh, to the next place that doesn't frustrate as much. Hey Sue, I'm going to yeah. give you the last word. Let, let's skip to the slide that 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 really provides the vision of your architecture. I think it's two slides in. So yeah, that, yeah, that one. So hey, uh, can you kind of sum it up? Sure, very quickly. Uh, the uh, I mean, our goal of the what we call our, our, our crime prevention platform, is to provide end-to-end -end protection to the financial institutions and the customers. Mm -hmm. uh, we provide uh, visual analytics that are used by fraud teams to get the 360-degree view of the customer behavior. Uh, we uh, increase the, the views for multi-channel activities. 
such that it brings us closer to making true up omnichannel uh, a reality for our customers. Uh, we cover the whole scope of banking as we've discussed, all the interactions from logging to actual transactions, uh, the insights into customer behavior, uh, provide advanced, uh, advanced protection, real-time control over fraudsters and the fraud uh, risk that they present. Uh, and, and all this is built on, on the industry-leading behavioral analytics and machine learning risk engine. Uh, we have an enterprise API that can be used for machine-to-machine -machine integration uh, and, and to give our customers the best protection they can get. Uh, on top of that, we add a fraud cockpit, which provides a full, the full business insights into fraud operation. And, and just recently, we've added the AML capability for, to prevent anti-money laundering. So, and again, we're working very closely with Star One uh, in, in, in the design and, and release of that product. So anyway, we're pretty excited. We think we have a, a pretty complete solution that can help our customers and their customers. Well, hey, Susan and Marguerite, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. I, I think it's been very helpful to get the perspective of, of you, Marguerite, as, as the person who's been on the ground dealing with this and, and monitoring it over, you know, over more than a decade and um, seeing fraud, fraud come, not go. It seems to just keep coming. That's the, that's the, that's the sad part about it. But, um, but there have been a lot of learnings along the way, and it sounds like what you and Guardian have been able to do together has really solved your, your, your problem. And what we're looking at here is an architecture that is designed to address all the various permutations of fraud and the channels that fraudsters are now co-opting to, uh, to make their business uh, your, uh, your problem. So thanks so much again for the great insights. Uh, there will be a replay of this on payments.com. We'll do a write-up that summarizes all the great points and insights that we captured today. Thank you all for giving us your time. It's very valuable and hope that you now see and believe what can be done to stop fraud in your environment. Thanks again, everybody. Marguerite.